So without further ado, I'm going to turn to uh, Taylor and Ben. And let's just start out, um, maybe Taylor, if you don't mind jumping in with giving us a sense of what do you feel about the current state of platform governance research today? Yeah, thank, thanks, Chris. And uh, good to join you all and uh, be, get the band back together with Ben. We, uh, the, we uh, have done many of these sort of conversations with the policy community and policymakers together, and, but it's been a while. So um, good to do this again. Um, so a, a few comments, I guess, about the research agenda um, and where it is right now. I mean, for one, and this is worth putting kind of an exclamation point on, is that a platform governance research agenda now exists as a thing. Um, that is a new turn of events. Even two or three years ago, um, a loosely tied group of people inter interested in content moderation, internet law, competition policy, data and privacy legislation, would not have called themselves a field of study that was unified uh, with a, a sort of single organizing principle that there are these things called platforms that require a different type of governance um, and a different constituency of researchers methodologies and empirical approaches to understanding them um, so that is a new thing and it is i think a positive thing um, but it comes with a, a number of complexities um, so when we're looking at the state of it, I think um, the discipline or the field or whatever we wanna call it um, is going through some of those growing pains right now, um, which I think are worth, worth highlighting. Um, one is, is because platforms affect so many aspects of our lives um, and intersect with so many aspects of society and cover so many policy issues, um, this community of researchers is still deeply fragmented um, by topic that they look on they look to by the disciplines they're embedded in, by their methodological approaches, seeing real, real divides between the, the usual fights between quantitative and qualitative researchers and regional approaches. Um, so we're seeing these real fragmentations, even though we're all sort of talking under this banner of governance, we're seeing fragmentation across all that. Um, I, another sort of things might come up again, I think is, is the, the discourse, the academic discourse is, um, remains distracted by the content moderation flashy object for lack of a better term. Um, we're seeing this now, I think just this week with all the Trump bans, um, time and time again, um, over the past five years, this entire discourse has been distorted by um, the controversy and in some ways, um, red herring, I think, of takedowns. Um, so I think that's something we have to come to terms with and the policy community needs to be sort of aware of that this is the research community is susceptible to this very thing as well. Um, the discourse remains still um, Western European and US focused. Um, and that is a problem. Um, these exact same issues are being discussed and debated with very different implications around the world. And the platform governance agenda and research community needs to become global in that respect. But as we can talk about this later. This brings a ton of challenges to it um, because we are not talking about a level playing field or a, an equal playing field for both the power that different countries have in this space and the forms of democratic accountability that exist in different regions and countries. Um, so that presents a real challenge. And just the, the final thing is the, is the research community still, and this is sort of beating an old drum here, is in a real empirical rut. Um, they are struggling in various ways to um, understand and engage with um, what continue to be black boxes. Um, and I think there's a real role when we talk later about governments here, um, that I think there's a real role in incentivizing um, and even forcing um, the kind of access that researchers need um, to, uh, to better understand the system. So a few notes about where this space is at the moment. Thanks a lot, Taylor. Um, ben, can I turn to you? I mean, what's your, what's your sense of the same question? Um, let me pick up where Taylor left off with the black box. And, and I want to take through a handful of the 
practical problems that I see that sit in between the research community and the policy community. I'll give you this example. I spoke this morning to a senior official at a large Western European government whose job is to interface with the platforms on COVID related disinformation. And I said to him, How, how's it going? <laughs> How do you think the platforms are doing with respect to removing and deep and, and, and down ranking COVID related disinformation, anti-vax content? And he leaned back in his chair and he said, I have no idea. I only know how they respond to the small number of examples that I give them that are fed to me by civil society activists and by research organizations that are tracking it. And the number of groups who are able to track it effectively at scale is very few. And we just don't have very much data. Do the platforms respond when I call them on specific particular posts? Yes, they do. Do I have any idea as to whether or not that is a meaningful impact on the larger market for COVID disinformation? No idea. This is an impossible environment in which to make good public policy. We have ample anecdotal evidence that the platforms are not doing a great job when it comes to dealing with harmful content, whether it's illegal or not. And we have no idea how to measure it. They could measure it anytime they wanted to and they won't. That's a blinking red light to me that the black box problem has to be solved by a combination of the research community and government. Square in the middle of the Digital Services Act. Arguably it's in the middle of the online harms proposal in the UK. It ought to be at the center of every discussion every government has in tackling this issue. Data access shouldn't be controversial. It should be the no brainer that everybody proceeds with right away. Second, related. Imagine a world in which <laughs> the legislators in their wisdom have given regulators and the researchers access to the black box. How do you audit the black box? If you had access to all the data and all the systems, could you make sense of it? Would you know what questions to ask a team of engineers from Facebook or Twitter or YouTube if you had them sat before you to get answers that you want? Because these guys will be prepared to give you answers that are meaningless. Yeah. And we need to work in advance to figure out what is our audit strategy? How are we going to meaningfully take the information that they provide and turn it into actionable intelligence to help protect the public from harmful content and to help understand better the impact of platforms on society, on democracy, on uh, public health, on climate, etc. A couple of other issues I want to flag. One is the another one that Taylor flagged that I want to go a little deeper on, which is the illegal content problem versus the harmful but not illegal content problem. If you look at even the most sophisticated regulatory proposals that are out there, they're mainly dealing with illegal content. Despite the fact that everybody who's paying attention recognizes that 99% of the problem is not illegal content, mm -hmm. is the artificial amplification of harmful but not illegal content harmful but not illegal content that is so amplified by attention optimizing algorithms that it distorts the public sphere. It creates the effect of a disproportionate conversation happening on extreme topics that are so sensational that they draw eyeballs, which has a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy effect. If people see with such great frequency an extreme debate happening in their social media feeds every day, it normalizes that conversation such that it's no longer distortive or disproportionate. It is actually reflective after a while. So, but how do you get at that harmful but not illegal content problem if you're a government that respects free speech? You're not going to make a list of the types of specific content that are not going to be allowed because what do you mean they're not going to be allowed? They're not illegal. What's, what's problematic is this distortive effect. How do you get at the distortive effect? Well, part of the getting at the distortive effect is, is back to black box and audit. But part of it is getting at it through some kind of strategy of dealing with harmful but not illegal content by making the platform's own policies with respect to that content more meaningful. And this is dissatisfying in and of itself, relying on the company's own policies to police their products such that the harm to the public are mitigated without actually telling them what those 
specific policies ought to be is, is very challenging. So you have a number of different approaches running around there on it. Uh, the risk management approach that's taken in the DSA is perhaps the most interesting, definitely worthy of more study. This question, both theoretically and practically at how government should deal with the harmful but not illegal speech problem, I think is, is, is essential for the policy and the research community to, to, to address. The last thing I wanna mention, although I could go on and on, I'll, I'll shut up after this one, is how do we deal with the unprecedented level of market power that these companies have in essentially a zero price market? How do you regulate monopoly power when consumer harm is not measured in rising prices? Let's look at what I think is the big story from the platform's response to the events of January 6th. It's not the deplatforming of Trump. Trump's comments are clearly illegal. The criteria that they would specify as to why he was taken out are uh, transparent and pre-existing. You, you can't go in the street and say those things, much less can you say them on social media. What's to me more profound is what's happening in the app stores. The app store is taking the decision that an app that is not effectively policing illegal content has no place in the app store. That is a major change and one that we haven't seen before. And again, private companies have the right to decide what they will and won't allow on their service. But when there are exactly two private companies that control the entire global market for mobile apps, that is an amazing amount of power that those guys have. And it's a very troubling that that kind of decision would be executed as much as I might agree with it in, in this specific case of parlor. That's not a power that we want to have out there without any kind of oversight, no transparency, no criteria being delivered to the people as to why that decision was being made. We are inviting a backlash of conspiracy that will, I think, haunt us if we're not careful about how we deal with this issue. And that is fundamentally a competition issue. It's a monopoly problem. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a ton of work that needs to be done on the theory of, of competition policy and on the practice of how you might go about regulating that without interfering with the private right of contracts and company and without interfering with the speech rights of those who are participating both as the platform host and as the application provider. Absolutely. It's interesting uh, in both examples you gave, uh, and I, I mean, I couldn't agree more, especially, you know, the deplatforming of Parler, um, while something that I, I personally may not see as problematic, it really did, really does flag that, that question. Do, do you think that's, I mean, as people are looking at, because I think one of the things that I'm hearing you say and hearing you say too, Taylor, is that we need to kind of think differently about how we're looking at how the apps, how the, the apps, how the, the platforms themselves work. Is this something we need to be focusing on? Is, is more on the sort of the kind of forcing them to change how they work and le maybe less on, on kind of the distraction of the content world? Yeah, I mean, in my view, it's a classic symptoms versus cause distinction. Um, we're playing whack-a-mole with outcomes and not focusing in on understanding and developing regulatory measures for the structural problems, which are, as Ben said, the use and abuse of data, the design of the systems, the business practices, and the scale leading to market concentration. Um, those things underlie many of these challenges, not all of them, but many of them. And I think addressing those first and then thinking about, okay, are there some edge cases that require these much more sensitive takedown policies or um, government, government involvement in speech decisions? Those things can arguably come later because um, they are the most difficult and the most politically vexing. And yet governments seem to be sort of um, a, just un, attracted to these most controversial decisions, which then risks undermining the broader agenda because they are in some ways the most vexing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it, it is funny. I mean, I think, you know, Ben, you hit the nail on the head with the, the issue of um, har harmful but not illegal speech. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that we found in, in looking at the sort of various pieces of research going on and, and the, the legislation being brought in, so much of the, the, the um, PR about the pieces of legislation focuses on that part of it, but the actual nuts and bolts of how things are being dealt with really just focus on the illegal side. And I think that that feels to me at least one of those emerging, one of those emerging things that we really need to make sure we've kind of gone back to, I guess, uh, and really make sure we're, we're sort of tackling. 
on, on that, and, and Ben, I'll, I'll turn to you in a second. Um, I'm curious to know, in addition to the things you've raised, are, are there elements that you sort of think are on nobody's agenda and really are the kind of the next thing we should be worrying about? So I remember when we were having this conversation last year, so like 12 months ago, which feels like another world, you know, one of the things we talked about is supply reduction and demand reduction and the idea that we're very focused on supply and we're not thinking enough about demand. You know, the, the other one that's come for me is um, there was a huge fear about deep fakes kind of infiltrating the whole of the community. And it feels like that's not materialized in the way we expected. But it, is that still out there? Is that still a concern? I mean, I can, when you asked about what issues were coming up, I mean, these are always, it's always tricky. But um, I mean, I, I can flag a few things that I think. I don't know if necessarily this year, but I think directionally are where some of those conversations headed. Um, one, I think we're gonna be talking a lot more about um, the stack of technologies that the Chinese government is exporting to illiberal regimes. Um, that is gonna become a big part of the platform conversation that we are seeing the emergence of a parallel stack of technologies that have very different arguably political implications when adopted by illiberal lean liberal or illiberal leaning and directionally heading regimes. Um, I think we're gonna be talking a lot about that when we look at this from a global perspective, uh, all using the same technology infrastructure um, and that has real consequence. Um, a second one is um, it's, we are talking about governing speech that is largely happening in public on platforms that at least have some degree of public visibility um, I have a feeling we're going to be talking more and more about private messaging and encryption and anonymity. Um, as you're already starting to see this it, just this week with a lot of organizational capacity moving to private messaging spaces um, that are by definition um, unknowable, um, or at least some of them are. Um, it presents real problems, and we've been through this before. Um, about online anonymity and encryption. And there's gonna be real pressure from governments to, um, to engage with that problem again in some ways that have a lot of um, downstream consequence as people on the call who've been those previous, through these previous debates um, over the last 20 years um, can attest. But we're headed there again, I think. Um, there's two more, a third is um, we've started to talk a lot about the splinter net of our technology infrastructure um, but I think we're going to see some other big um, global divisions. Um, as the world starts to govern these platforms differently, the response from the platforms is going to be to have different policies in different countries and regions. And we're already starting to see that. Um, terms of service agreements from these platforms are being administered very differently in different countries. Um, and we often don't know, like we don't have a lot of visibility on that. Facebook's term of service looks very different in India than it does in the United States. Um, and so I think we've been pushing for this governance agenda to, to be overlaid on top of this infrastructure. Um, the platforms are now responding to that and they are gonna behave differently in different markets. And I think we have to respond to that and understand we're not necessarily dealing with one global set of policies applied equally by platforms and with a degree of visibility we might like. Um, and finally, all of the companies we're talking about due to the market sc scale and concentration that Ben mentioned are moving beyond just being information systems. Um, I think we have to be ready for that. Um, they are moving into healthcare, to financial services, into the intelligence space, into biotech and human augmentation. Um, there are a, mar a markets in which these companies are moving and if we remain focused just on governing speech, um, we're gonna miss that entire space. Um, even though some of the same structural dynamics are in place as they move into these new markets. Um, and I'm not sure we're fully prepared for that. Thank you. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, no, it's, it's interesting. Um, the, the question of uh, terms of service has just come up in, 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 you know, in the last last couple of days. I think it's a really good reminder, though, too, that there, you know, while we focus very much on sort of the transatlantic conversation, there are these other things going on in other places that are rapidly going to have an impact on us. And, and I think that that stack of, of Chinese technology solutions really is one that I, I don't think um, we've been seized with nearly enough uh, from a government perspective. 
Ben, can I put the same question to you um, to build on Taylor's point? Sure. I mean, I think he's right about all those things. I, I would add a couple. I'll pick up on your framing, Chris, on, on supply and demand side. I mean, almost all of our policy agenda is focused on regulating the supply of content by near monopoly service providers. But if you play it out several years down the road, let's say we're effective in developing law and policy to constrain the manipulation of platforms, the application of harmful but not illegal content, the more effective takedown of illegal activity. And we get to the end of the rainbow and figure out actually people are so habituated into the self-selection of content on the internet that it doesn't actually change that much about uh, the complexion of our political culture. Now what? We will have ignored the fact that there is a lot of human nature that these technologies are, 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 are taking advantage of and that we, we need to counter that by thinking about, all right, how do you, how do you change people's attitudes towards the consumption of digital information? How do you construct a new set of norms? And one of the things I see as most problematic in the digital media environment is not necessarily about the content at all, or even about the mechanism of amplification of curation algorithms. It's about the, the norm-free environment of interaction. There's a kind of permissiveness to troll your neighbor on Twitter that just isn't there if you're sitting around the table in a bar the usual constraints that human beings feel about throwing insults at one another or in, it, 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 intensifying rhetoric from one moment to the next, they're just not there on social media. And so how do you reestablish those? How do you, how, do you tr how do you build a system of digital literacy and an understanding uh, in the public over a long period of time. I think that's an education policy issue and a major funding challenge. Secondarily, I think we keep expecting somehow that if we can somehow tamp down all the toxicity in the digital media market, that the glorious Habermasian public sphere will rise back to the surface and we will have a rational debate again. <laughs> that presumes that we've got sufficient instruments of public journalism to provide accurate reporting about what's going on in the world and that people care to read it and to use that as a guidepost for their understanding of the world. I think we're shifting away from that. The decline of public service journalism and the void that is left in the information market is something I absolutely have to think we have to, put, to pay attention to and that we're not adequately addressing, particularly in countries where we've seen um, uh, the news media declined dramatically. There's no public sector alternatives to speak of. I think we need to think about what does a media market look like that isn't just replicating uh, the, uh, the New York Times in every format that we can think of to like, if only you were better informed then you would agree with me. Like people need to have different kinds of media out there that, that provide them with a different experience but which don't lead them down rabbit holes of conspiracy and disinformation. How do we begin to build that? And I think we need to be ad addressing it now. These are big, big expensive things to do. So last thing that I'll flag, which I think is a major issue which we aren't talking enough about is tax. These are some of the largest com companies in the history of the world, some of the most valuable companies in the history of the world. Their profit margins are astonishing, good for them. They're paying less in taxes than any, even the lowest wage worker in every developed country. That, this is an unacceptable set of affairs. And, it's not, and they're not even breaking laws. They are abusing the laws that we allow them to run by. And the principal villains in the story are Western countries who like the idea of, of having tax havens for wealthy individuals and corporations. And until we get serious about tax avoidance, we're not going to have a fair redistribution of the kind of profits that they are making. And we're not gonna be able to finance all of these kinds of solutions that we need in order to fix the health of our information markets and, and our democratic public sphere. Thank you. That's that's a fantastic point to end on, and I and I think it's it's um, you're right. It's one of those things we really don't think about or talk about enough in this. You know, we've sort of structured ourselves almost in a way in conversations, and I think it, it actually ties in very neatly with your previous conversation, previous point about sort of the need to rebuild kind of a public conversation, where when we talk about taxation, it's almost like taxation is is a um, is a negative in society, rather than the thing which you know reinforces all of those other. 
uh, other elements. I, I, I was talking on the weekend, uh, something different, but I was reminded in the UK, I don't know if they still do this, but many hospitals have uh, parking lot nurses where they'll actually identify the person who's funded from the parking lot revenues. And that's the, the sort of primary healthcare provider who's, who's kind of there. Uh, I, I just, it feels like there needs to be a different kind of conversation about how taxation works. It's interesting because I think in a way one, you know, you, you've both, you've said like the thing we're focusing on content is the problem. I, I, we should, we're focusing too much on that. We really need to think more about sort of the, the tech underpinnings behind it. And then we need to think about the actual societal, so, sort of societal pieces, um, uh, really what binds us together as a community. Do you see, do you see hope there, Ben? I mean, do you see that there are, you know, I, I was really struck by your, your comment on digital media literacy. I mean, it's something that's very de dear to me. I think it's really an important element. But I worry a lot, and a lot of the conversations that I have are with people who say, yeah, we can talk to kids, but how do we get access to adults? How do we get access to those people who are sharing things, who are uh, trolling their neighbors, who, who are sort of engaging in this, like, descending conspiracy thinking? I mean, it's very hard, and it takes a long time, but it can be done. And I think there are some interesting precedents that we can study since we're talking about the research agenda. Let's look at tobacco. What was it, how was it that we went from a scenario where most people had no problem with cigarettes and didn't see them as a public health hazard to everyone pretty much understanding them as a public health hazard? That was a period, a long period of education, but there was a moment when it hit a tipping point when it went rather quickly. How did that happen? What were the things, how, how, what, what were the public advertising campaigns that we invested in? What would the education plan look like? Yeah, there was a lot targeted at kids, but it wasn't just kids. Another one that may be more subtle is organic food. I mean, it, tobacco stretches back before my lifetime, but organic food wasn't the thing when I was a kid. And now there seems not only to be organic food every supermarket I walk into, but there's a broad understanding in the public that if you can buy organic food, it's probably better for you. How did that happen? What were the things that went into making that happen? Labeling and uh, uh, commercial advertising and market incentives to put products out there that are better for you and not just better tasting. I think there are analogies that we can work with here and think about that are potentially useful. But this is, this is a, these are very, very hard challenges and they're going to take a long time. And that's why you got to start now and you almost have to be a government to invest in these kinds of programs because you're not going to see a payout for 20 years. Yeah, that's actually a great lead into our final question. Um, and, and I think that's you know something that I know you've been, uh, you focus a lot on is, and, and you've talked about a little bit today, um, and you know, I, I think the seeds are there. We need to look when we're looking at regis, uh, legislation and regulation, we need to look at the black box. But are there things that governments could be focusing efforts on now around supporting research, uh, You know, the kinds of things you're talking about? Are there other tools that we're not using? Are there other ways we're not approaching these issues that we should be looking at? Let me jump in. Um, look, I think that's a, that's a big one, some of these long, issues that have longer term arcs, both to understand and to implement um, are things that are difficult for agency, for organizations, whether they be nonprofits or the private sector or even researchers um, to, to take on on their own. Um, I mean, there's a couple other things I would flag here. I mean, I think I, when you asked this, I, I immediately thought that one of the things governments could really do to, <laughs> to help the research community is actually to open up their black boxes as well. Um, this entire community of policymaking um, is, a, is very opaque to the research community. We do not know how these decisions are being made. We don't even know what's being talked about inside government. Um, we're asked on rare occasions to, to brief government officials. Um, often it's civil servant briefings are totally disconnected from political briefings. Um, governments hide information even from the departments that are supposed to be collaborating with each other, right? So, so this, this charge of opacity that we put onto platforms and indeed it needs to be put back on governments as well and say, what does it mean to actually open up and collaborate in a sense or provide meaning, ac meaningful access and feedback to the research community that's studying these, these topics, I think is, is really important. Um, Another is, 
two more things. One, <clears throat> your um, Chris, your comment about statistical agencies, I think is really important. <clears throat> we have some agencies in government that could be incredibly valuable and have precedent dealing with some of the really wicked problems um, that we face here. I think they're, so just take the data access example. It's, um, it's much easier to say um, platforms should give more data to researchers and governments. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to deal with how that data should be stored, who should have it. Should governments really be mandating um, and storing themselves this kind of private information? Um, do we trust research networks to hold and secure it in the way that we think it needs to be done? Um, and some arm's length government agencies actually have a lot of history with this. Um, StatsCan in Canada is a good example. They hold all sorts of sensitive information um, about Canadians and do so in a responsible way and have a history and precedent of doing it and giving access in a limited way to that data to researchers. Um, so I think there's some real levers there. Another big lever though that governments have, now they don't control completely, but they influence is the funding agencies. And a huge amount of the research agenda is driven by the priorities, incentives delivered by the academic funding bodies. Um, and those are very rarely um, policy engagement and impact. Um, and I think if we could have some funding programs via the, the academic research bodies that incentivized collaboration between policymakers and researchers that kind of directionally nudged the research community to care about that kind of work, um, it would make a huge difference because I mean, it's, it's kind of a sad testament to the state of much of academics, frankly. Um, but those incentives, you cannot underestimate the role that those incentives play in directing what gets researched and um, how that information gets communicated or not. Um, that's a real, a real lever governments have too. Well, thanks for bringing that up. That, that's one that I just, I, it, it strikes me as, as odd how difficult it is to refocus our, our research organizations to actually deal with problems that, that might be useful for, for government research. Um, it's, it's and it goes having lived ways, through right? it. Like, yeah, yeah I'm, on the, I'm on the board of SHRC, the Canadian Social Science Research Council. And even within the organization, it is difficult for them to, to take this on um, yeah. because they are made up of people who come from the academic world, who have these incentives embedded in, in their modes of production. And I think we need to nudge that in the right direction, in a different direction. Um, absolutely. Ben, can I turn to you for a final comment? I know we're gonna wrap up this part of the session uh, and it's been super useful having you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just make one quick point, which is uh, I'll circle right back to where Taylor started with how do we get, how do, how do we reverse this siloization of platform accountability research and the policy agenda around digital threats to democracy? And I think there's a big role for government here too. Anybody who's ever worked in government understands that these, these policy challenges that cut across multiple departments are poorly handled by governments. You get into turf wars and different ministers decide they're gonna take different pieces of it and they're not coordinated and you quickly lose the broader understanding of how it all fits together. So I think that we need to encourage political leadership in government in particular to continue to identify the broader narrative that stitches together all of the component pieces. Yes, the data regulators are gonna to have to get into privacy issues. Yes, the uh, competition authorities are gonna to have to look at monopolies. Yes, we're gonna to have to invest in digital literacy. These are all likely to be different parts of government, but we need to have an overarching narrative which says, look, we have something very new in our democracies that's causing havoc. It is a sea change in our uh, media marketplace and we need to do something about all these issues from public safety to personal privacy to competitive marketplaces. And it all fits together in a broad understanding of the world, much the same way that we do with climate change or we do with economic and social inequality, racial justice. We see these things as crossing and touching on lots of different pieces of government. We've got to keep that big narrative uh, in order to hold public attention and to keep this on the priority list. Great. Thank you very much for that. That's a, that's a great way to end. And thanks so much, Ben, for joining us today. I um, really appreciate your comments and your thoughts.